We left off last time talking about crazy one-armed John Wesley Powell, who was one of the early explorers of the Grand Canyon, first geologist, certainly, that traveled the length of the Grand Canyon via the Colorado River, and one of the first people to travel through the base of the Grand Canyon. What was he looking for? What did he discover? Well, he was looking at deep time. He was one of the first people that had an understanding of deep time that explored the Grand Canyon with that concept in mind. The enormous amount of time that passed between the deposition of these rocks and the deposition of these rocks down here. When we look back to Steno's idea of original horizontality and superposition, we can see that illustrated in this diagram. We have a mountainous region that's undergoing weathering, producing clastic sediment that's flowing down the river when it reaches the quiet water of an ocean basin or a lake, it's going to settle out. As it settles out, it's going to assume a nearly horizontal orientation. And what you see here are some strata, previously existing strata, that are oriented at an angle relative to the horizontal strata here. We're going to get back to what this is in a few minutes. So this sediment is going to be deposited in horizontal layers that are ultimately going to be compressed from the overlying weight and compacted and converted into sedimentary rock. We can see that here using a limestone as an example from Marble Canyon. The older sediment is beneath the younger sediment. The young sediment on top, older sediment on the bottom. It's a law of superposition. Now, when we look at fossils, this gives us the added benefit of a higher resolution time reconstruction. Whereas sandstone has been forming since the beginning of the formation of the Earth's crust, most of that sandstone's gone now, but it was forming then. It would look very similar to sandstone forming today. However, there were no fossils at all in the 4.1 or so billion year old early sandstones compared to today. So what does that look like in example form? Here we have outcrop A with a sequence of rocks of different ages and outcrop B, another sequence of rocks of different ages. So we're gonna to start to compare these two to see if there's a relationship between any of these layers from one outcrop to another. So here we see some distinctive fossils, some fish, some brachiopods, turritellid, gastropods, and ammonite. In this layer, we see the ammonite, just like we do here. We see the same brachiopods and the same turritellid as we do here. So these are going to be approximately the same age. Therefore, if these fossils are found here, this sequence of rock is likely to be the same age as this sequence of rock, both of which are older than sequence one here. So some of these fossils found in outcrop A are going to be the same as the fossils found in outcrop B, and this is going to be some distance away. Whether it's 10 kilometers or 1,000 kilometers, this can still work. Therefore, layers with the same fossils are the same age. Now here we have some additional fossils. We see the brachiopod, same species as here and here. Now we have the addition of a trilobite. So when we put all this together, we can see that sequence one in outcrop A is distinctive, but it's not found in outcrop B. So it's missing from this outcrop. Putting all of this together, we can generate a stratigraphic section. Again, with the older rocks on the bottom, intermediate rocks in the middle, youngest rocks on top. When we started reconstructing geologic history from the stratigraphic record, we noticed there were gaps in the record. These are sometimes called lacuna, something that's missing. These are apparent in disconformities and angular unconformities. First example is going to be a disconformity. Here in time one, we're looking at sedimentary sequences beneath the ocean. They've accumulated in layers A through D, A being the oldest, D being the youngest. Now we're going to lift this bedding up via tectonic activity. Tectonic forces cause this bed to rise above sea level, exposing them to erosion. Same thing happened to the 
rocks that make up the Grand Canyon. Same thing happened here nearby. This is Monument Valley, Utah. And what we see here are some monuments. These are all natural. These are in the Navajo sandstone. So a quartz sandstone deposited by wind during the Jurassic that has about 3% hematite present. That gives it this distinctive red color. So we've lifted our rocks, exposed them to weathering. Erosion is going to strip away layer D. As we saw in the last image, the upper layers have been stripped away, leaving an irregular surface of hills and valleys, just like we see in Monument Valley. Time four, we're now going to force this sequence of rocks back below sea level. And it's going to result in deposition of layer E on top of layer C, because layer D has been removed via erosion. The result is an unconformity. This rock is very different in age than this rock, whereas this rock may be slightly younger than this rock, and so on down through the sequence. So there's a gap, a lacuna, an unconformity here on the surface. Putting it all together here, we have deposition of a sequence within marine waters, tectonic uplift, removal of one of the layers, the D layer here. We're going to leave an erosive surface that is going to be subsequently covered by a younger sequence of sedimentary rocks. Now, in the case of an angular unconformity, we throw in an additional complication, an additional twist, literally, of the rocks. Here we have our initial sequence form. We have uplift in conjunction with folding and deformation of the sedimentary beds. So we're introducing some structure now into the previously flat-lying horizontal beds. With compression, we have crunched up these rocks. Now, upon exposure, the erosion is going to strip away the tops of the folds, usually, unless they're very resistant rock, and that does happen. And the result is we are left with an uneven plane with exposed portions of several folded beds. This is very common in the geologic record. Now, subsequently, this deformed, tectonically deformed series of beds is going to drop below sea level, reignite sedimentation on top of that. So here, because the beds are at an angle relative to one another, this is an unconformity that is known as an angular unconformity. So the unconformity is represented by sedimentary rock that was deposited horizontally initially, was deformed, eroded, and then covered by subsequent sediment. Now we see this angular unconformity in the Grand Canyon. The um, expedition of 1869 was the first to observe this, the first group of scientists to observe this. And what you see here are the earlier sedimentary sequences at this angle with subsequent sequences forming in the horizontal orientation above these exposed angular beds. And then just putting all that together, here we see the, again, the Vishnu schist, the 1.7 billion year old schist, bright angel shales down here as well. And then looking at it from far away, you can see the angular unconformity very clearly here. So it's obvious in this situation from this viewpoint, this is an angular unconformity. Now this is a photo that unfortunately looks terrible. Uh, I took this off of uh, Beersy, a little island in the Hebrides of Scotland. What it represents is previous sedimentary rocks that were lithified and uplifted and distorted deformed such that they're now at an angle to the horizontal. If this is subsequently covered by the sea here, which we suspect due to global warming, this could be the next great angular unconformity in the works. Now, you need to be careful in that just because you see multiple angles in sedimentary sequences doesn't mean it's an angular unconformity. Here, Again, we have the Navajo sandstone, in this case in Zion National Park. And what you see here are not angular unconformities, they're just cross beds. So beware 
of the cross beds. The fact that there are so many different angles and so many different beds here uh, implies that there's no way this is an angular unconformity. It's a bunch of cross beds from the crazy winds of the Jurassic period. You can see that again here. I think this is the Great Throne. Uh, I forget the, the common name, this, this cliff face here. So you see angular orientations between different sequences in this rock. This brings us to a new, slightly more complicated relationship known as a cross-cutting relationship that are going to include faults and intrusions. Again, starting with our depositional sequence of rocks in the marine environment, we're going to deform these rocks and uplift them. And now we're going to throw in a pluton, like the one that generated Yosemite. This pluton is going to inject hot rock through previously existing sedimentary sequences. This hot rock, because it's an angle, is going to be called a dike. So these dikes are cutting across folded beds. And in order for a dike to cut across a bed, the bed has to exist. So that implies an age relationship. The bed came first, then the intrusion of the dike. Taking it a step further, we've now had the dikes in place and we're going to introduce a fault. So we have the foot wall here, the hanging wall here, and we've truncated the dike at that fault. So the dike previously went to this point and then continued up through the other sequence of rocks. Now it's been displaced and you see an offset in an outcrop, like a road cut, for instance. Going to the North Atlantic, this is from a trip I took to Bjornoya. Bjornoya means a bear island. It's really in the middle of nowhere. And it looks like this. This is Ian Walker, one of our Welsh scientists on the expedition. And what you see here are some previously existing Ordovician sedimentary sequences that have been offset by faulting. So this fault here and here is going to truncate the original sedimentary sequence. Now let's look at a complicated yet fairly common sequence of events. So we're going to use cross sections based on field maps to understand the characteristics of the strata and the relationships between them. So we have a previously horizontal sequence of sedimentary rocks that have been deformed and metamorphosed. We have an unconformity. That rock was exposed and weathered. And on top of that was deposited sandstones, limestone, shales. And eventually that was uplifted and weathered away. So we end up with yet another angular unconformity here. So we go from an unconformity here to an angular unconformity here. And then we have a sequence of aeolian sand dunes that become sedimentary rock. And they're going to contain terrestrial fossils. A granitic intrusion may or may not be the source of the metamorphic heat here. So the sequence of events is ordered here alphabetically. So these sediments were first. Intrusion was second. This unconformity was third. Deposition of these sediments is fourth. The angular unconformity after erosion is fifth. And the cap sandstones occurred last, sixth. And you can see how all that occurred following the flow chart here. Horizontal layers deposited in water. These are deformed. An intrusion of magma enters the sequence, metamorphosing previously deformed sedimentary beds. We develop an erosional surface, new layers of marine sediment deposit on top of that, giving us our unconformity. We're going to reactivate the tectonic activity and the compression, and we're going to uplift the new sequence, which is on top of the older sequence, and we're going to truncate that erosionally, wear that down to nearly a plane. And we're going to run river systems across this surface. And these river systems are going to generate and deliver clasts from higher land nearby 
deposit that sand here along with terrestrial fossils. So this could be a combination of wind and water deposited sedimentary rock. Because it has terrestrial fossils, it was deposited above sea level. Now this brings us to relative ages. These are divisions of geologic time. They include eras, periods, and epochs or epochs, depending on where you're from. Here we have an example of a variety of important index fossils. To be a really good index fossil, you have to appear everywhere all at once and then die off everywhere all at once, like COVID. It appeared and it went everywhere all at once. Hopefully it's going to die off all at once very soon. It would be a great index fossil. It lasted for say two years and then it's gone. We can hope. So starting with the Cambrian period, we have trilobites as one of our most representative fossils. We enter the Ordovician after the Cambrian Ordovician extinction. And at the end of the Ordovician, we have a mass extinction. This brings us into the Silurian. The Silurian is known for Eurypterids. These are called, I think, water scorpions, something like that. But they can be two meters long. So if you imagine a scorpion that's two meters long that can swim after you, that's what we're dealing with here. The Devonian is characterized in this case by Dunkleosteus. That's a placoderm or bone skinned fish. And this fish's head is about five and a half feet in diameter, six feet, something like that. It's in the, um, I think it's in the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And here we have Dimetrodon, representative of Permian land dwellers, followed by another mass extinction. This is the biggest of all, the 95% or 95% of life went extinct at this boundary 250 million years ago. So this boundary between the Permian and the Triassic is also a boundary between the Paleozoic ancient life and the Mesozoic middle life. Okay, so we have a mass extinction here at 441, another mass extinction in the late Devonian, big mass extinction at the end of the Permian. Coming into the Triassic, we have rapid evolution of dinosaurs, followed by a mass extinction between the Triassic and the Jurassic. And then the big sauropods come. When we end the Jurassic with a smaller extinction, we enter the Cretaceous. Cretaceous is represented by Tyrannosaurus rex and a bunch of other characteristic dinosaurs that we remember from our childhood. That's followed by another mass extinction this is the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction. It used to be called the KT or Cretaceous Tertiary mass extinction. This tertiary is now the Paleogene and Neogene. So another mass extinction event here, around oh, 50 to 65% of organisms went extinct at this boundary. So it's a big one for sure, but not nearly as big as this one. It is enough though to take us out of the middle life into modern life, the Cenozoic. And now because the fossil record is more complete and therefore we see more fossils, we can break up these periods into epochs or epochs. Essentially these are percentages of the animals that are present today. Just like with the geological periods, each epoch is characterized by distinctive fossils. If you're wide awake right now, maybe you've noticed that the geologic periods start and stop when certain plants and animals appear and disappear. Is this a coincidence or a correlation? Turns out that geologists divided geologic time based on fossils. When lots of different kinds of fossils no longer appear in the geologic record, that period comes to an end. That means that each and every boundary represents a dramatic extinction event. Starting with the Paleocene, which roughly translates to early dawn of the recent, we see, uh, we use cool mammals for these. The um, mammal known as the condylarth. It's kind of a cat, weasel, monkey looking critter. Following that, Eocene, which translates to dawn of the modern, is based on the percentage of mollusks that are present in the Eocene versus the present. 
Now, the mammals of the Eocene include the Abrontotheridae, also known as the Titanotheres, and they look pretty much like the name sounds. Titanotheer sounds kind of like a giant tank monster. The Eocene and the Oligocene are separated by a very interesting extinction event that was unknown until about 20 years ago. And it was some work we did in the Gulf Coast using fish ear bones that determined the extinction event was caused by colder winters. And I'll put up a link for those of you that are interested in reading up on that. The Oligocene that follows the Eocene means few new. And again, this refers to the number of mollusk species. In the Oligocene, we have gomphotheres. These are shovel-jawed mastodons, really weird-looking creatures. Following the Oligocene, we have the Miocene, which means less recent, again referring to mollusk species. And here we have the chalicotheres, giant odd-toed ungulates that look like a UFC giraffe or a, some kind of horse bear orangutan. This is followed by the Pliocene, which means more recent. Again, relative to mollusk species. And at this time, we have three-toed horses running around in Tibet that look pretty much like modern Tibetan horses. Then we have the Pleistocene. This is most new, again referring to mollusks. And Homo sapiens is probably the best-known mammal of the Pleistocene. And the Holocene, which means all recent, again referring to mollusk species. And... That's where we are now, here in cyberspace. When you put this whole list of animals together in order, you have the geologic time scale. This is relative time. We know that one thing comes before or after another. We just don't know how many years have elapsed in between those events. And that was as good as it was going to get until about a century ago. 